Good morning, welcome to Billingshurst Family Church Online. My name's Craig and I'm hosting this morning. Um, it's going to be a great time today together as we gather online to celebrate the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for us. We're going to spend some time in worship. The, the Hall and Rowe families have recorded uh, a, a worship track for us. It's great to see how technology has been embraced and is being used to enable all of us to have a time in worship uh, together, although apart. We've then got uh, a testimony from Russell Courting and I can promise you it's going to have an impact on you and uh, it's quite hard hitting and um, so just be prepared for that and just listen to see what God might say to you through his testimony how he might encourage you through that. And then finally we're going to have a sermon which Neil has recorded for us all about uh, obeying those in authority and uh, again it's a very matter of fact sermon and uh, I know it's impacted me quite a lot since listening to it and I know it's going to impact you as well. So I'm going to pray and then we will get on with our morning. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are mighty and I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would be speaking to us this morning. You would impact our hearts and our minds and Lord God, let us not leave today the same as when we came into it. Let us be challenged and see the benefit of being challenged and let us be changed, Lord. We, we hope to be made more and more into the likeness of your Son, Father, um, or like your Son, Lord Jesus, that, um, uh, to be more like him. And that, um, Lord, I pray that this morning will be a time where we do become more like the Lord Jesus. So be with us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to Liz to lead us in worship.
let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be Thank you, worship team, for the great job you've done in, uh, lead, in preparing that song and uh, especially to the wider team for being able to pick up um, so, so much technology in a relatively short space of time to enable us to worship together. Uh, while I'm thanking people, I want to say a big thanks to everyone who's been involved in our kids' work and in our live stream for children. Uh, uh, sorry, our, um, our Zoom meeting, sorry, for the children of BFC. It's been great to know there are people uh, like Nick and um, uh, Claire and Rachel and others who have been taking a real, um, real effort to engage our children in this time. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you to them. Well done, guys. You've done a great job. Uh, we're now going to go over and have a listen to Russell Courting. And um, it's going to be, uh, as I said earlier, it's going to be a quite challenging and quite uh, hard to hear. But it is really important that we take time to listen to how God's been working in other people's lives over, over the years. Uh, so I'm going to now hand over to Russell. Hi, everyone. My name is Russell, and I just wanted to share a short testimony of how the Lord has walked with me through a time of struggle and grief and how that story is still kind of unfolding today. When I was younger, my brother Joseph and I were very active in our local swimming club. We were both very competitive and trained up to 10 times a week in the swimming pool. We used to go to competitions every weekend all around the country and our swimming club was like one big happy family. When I was 13 and he had just turned 17, we went for our usual evening training session, but about halfway through that session, he stopped and turned to our coach and said he didn't feel very well. Then he passed out at the side of the pool and they, they started to resuscitate him and they rushed him off to hospital. But unfortunately, he passed away that night. For the whole swimming club and my family, it was a very painful time. We even had reporters come and interview us from the local news because it was such a sad and unexpected story for a healthy 17 year old to just pass away. Losing my brother like that was, was extremely traumatic for me and him being gone left a huge hole in my life. When you've just become a teenager, you don't expect that to happen and you don't really have the tools or the know-how to handle that grief. The grieving process was a long road for me to walk with highs and also a lot of lows. And you know, I questioned often, why Lord? Why? Why allow him to die? It's not fair. He had his whole life in front of him. And at one point I even wished it was me rather than him that had died because of the pain. But looking back, I can see the Lord at work. I've been blessed to be brought up in a Christian home. My parents completely relied on the Lord to get them through that period. And they really encouraged me to just press in deep into the Lord and to just rely on him as well to support me. This will always be a sad memory in my heart and there's still days ahead where it hurts but I know the Lord has been with me and will continue to be with me every day and one way that the Lord has actually used this for good is I've had the privilege of sharing my story with people who are suffering from loss as well and my brother passing away has allowed me to have an understanding about that loss and to encourage people who are grieving to know that 
no matter what road that you are walking, the Lord is there with you every step of the way. Thanks. Thanks, Russell. It's uh, really hard to share such a, um, a story that is so close to your heart and that's had such an impact on your life. So thank you for sharing, Russ. Um, and my prayer is that everyone who's watched this video today is going to have heard that and seek to um, respond, considering how hard things are right now and thinking about them in the context of thing, suffering around the world um, and just think actually we can come to our God, we can know his peace even through the hardest of times. Um, so I really pray that you would be impacted by that. I'm now going to hand over to Neil who has prepared the sermon for us, um, but before we get there I'm just going to pray. Lord God, I thank you for Neil. I thank you, Lord God, that you give him the heart of a teacher and uh, that he loves your word. And I pray that we would not be the same by the end of this morning um, than when we started. And I pray, Lord God, that his words would be words that you've spoken and you're speaking to us. Or would you bring them alive, his words alive to us today by your Holy Spirit, that we might be changed and that we might have a bigger picture of who you are, Lord God. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name's Neil. Uh, I'm one of the elders here at Billingshurst Family Church, and you are really welcome. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at a bit about authority, how we um, think about our government and those who rule over us, kind of balancing the important truth that we need to respect them and honour them and submit to them, but also how we handle it when they don't do what we want, when we need to question them, when we need to challenge them. And um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when the lockdown started, there was a real sense of cooperation. And it was wonderful the way that everyone put aside maybe their, their likes and dislikes and did what the government asked, made the sacrifices that we needed, did the things that we were told to do so that we could be safe and hopefully get the virus down to a reasonable level as we're beginning to enjoy at the moment. And um, I was quite amazed how long it lasts actually. And I, I have some colleagues at work who I've worked with for, for nearly 20 years. Um, we don't tend to work in the same areas now, but we keep in touch. We have a little WhatsApp group that we chat to one another on. And it's interesting because none of them are particularly for the government that we have, particularly Boris Johnson. And yet there was a real sense of when things started and, and particularly when the media were criticising, a sense that we needed to, not, to stop doing this and to support our government and get on with stuff. And uh, that was quite interesting, I thought. And it lasted for quite a while. I think generally, didn't it, across the nation. But obviously that's changed. It's getting harder and harder. There have been lots of decisions made, some of which we might think are a rash or too quick or they don't make sense or they seem a bit arbitrary why this is allowed and this isn't allowed. Different governments in the UK doing different things as well. There's been a lot of other stuff going on. There seems to be um, a lot of inequality in that those who are less well off seem to get more affected by what's happened than others. Um, I think obviously with uh, ethnic minorities and the way that many of them seem to be a lot iller and suffer more from the consequences of the coronavirus, what's happened with George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters as well. It's hard, isn't it? And it's hard not to be cynical. It's hard not to think, oh, here they go again, getting it all wrong. Or, or maybe just, I can't be bothered. I'm not interested in that sort of thing and kind of disengaging. And I, I just wonder as Christians, whether that really is the sort of way we should behave. Is that the way Jesus wants us to act? And, and whenever we come across something like that, it's good to look at God's word. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a short passage in Romans, in Romans 13, verses 1 to 7, where Paul really talks about how we need to respond to authority. So before we read, I read from God's word, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to say, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you guide us now. We want to hear what you think. We want to, we want to understand what you're calling us to do, what you want us to be like. And uh, most of all, we want to be more like Jesus in everything that we do. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, now you'll guide us and particularly help me as I look into God's word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 
OK, I'm going to read from Romans 13, uh, starting from verse 1. And I'm reading from the ESV version of the Bible. And Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. But because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honour to whom honour is owed. Paul doesn't really give us any wriggle room, does he? The words be subject to imply submission and obedience. And the reason Paul uses this kind of language is not because of the authorities, of whether they are good or bad at what they do. It's because God has appointed them and put them in place. And in a sense, what Paul is saying here is that resisting the governing authorities is effectively resisting God and his authority to rule and reign over us. And that is hard, isn't it? And it's quite surprising, really, because the authorities that Paul and the church were under were not particularly good. The Roman Empire and the government that came with it, they were imposed. Most people, it was due to com um, conquest. They weren't elected. And I would say they were a lot less considerate to the people that they ruled than our government is today. And yet Paul reminds them that the, that the authorities brought order and protection. And it's interesting, isn't it, to think about what would happen if there were no government, to think about what anarchy would be like, where people can just do what they want and there's no rule of law and just how dangerous and unsafe that would be. Because governments, good and bad, Paul tells us, are God's agents for good order, for safety and protection. The sword, kind of talking about the punishment aspect of government. At that time, there would have been a death penalty, uh, imprisonment, fines, all that kind of stuff. And that's the something that God has given them as government as something to help them do the job that they need to do and keep society safe and to keep everybody protected. And it doesn't mean that governments can't be resisted. Um, but only really when they go against God's law, or maybe what they do is so evil and so painful and dangerous to people that they need to be resisted and replaced. And I don't have to look at this, at, at this now, but there are several cases where God raised up leaders, particularly in the, the last services we looked at in Judges, where there were rulers that were down basically doing bad things to God's people. And God raised up leaders to replace that government. And there are plenty of cases in the Bible where people um, had to resist the civil authorities because what they were asking them to do, what they were suggesting, went against God's law. But it's interesting because when they do that, it was very limited. It was just resisting what they said, nothing else. And they did it with respect and they followed all the rules as much as they could. And you, you get a sense of kind of unwillingness almost to disobey, but kind of they were forced to do that. But we have to be real here, don't we? Our government's not like that. And I don't think we've got any justification for replacing our government in a kind of a forceful way. And, um, and our resistance as such must be uh, limited to specific issues or things that we need to deal with. I think it's good to confront injustice, to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves, um, and also to 
uh, engage well with the government when they're doing things that we feel are wrong and against God's law. But even then, it must be done with respect and with an attitude of honour to those for the position that they hold as we question and challenge them. And um, I guess I was thinking about how do we do that? How do we individually, how do each of us be the good citizens that Paul is talking about here? And I would sum that up with three words, and that is honour, obedience and contribution. Honour, I think, is a real challenge and it's very hard. Um, the kind of media culture, the kind of society that we live in makes it hard for us to think of our governments with honour and respect. It's very easy to pick holes and criticise and spot what they do wrong and they get lots of things wrong. And there's kind of a natural response to be cynical and to think ill of the motives and actions of those in authority. But of course that doesn't make it right. And I think the key way that we can respect and honour them is not to focus on how good or bad they are. It's to remember they're put there by God and that when we dishonour them we are dishonouring our God and our Lord. And it doesn't mean we can't question or seek change. But it means that our attitude to them and the way that we approach them, the way that we treat them, the way that we think about them has to be respectful for the authority that God has given to them. And as we do this, we are honouring our God and we're serving him well. And then another word that we probably don't like, and that's obedience. Because we need to obey, even when we think we know better. And um, For a trivial example, I don't really have a problem with obeying the speed limit in built up areas because I want to make sure that people are safe. But I struggle a bit when I'm driving on a, on a, on a safe country road in good weather um, where the limit is 60 and then suddenly it seems to go down. It might just go down to 50, it might go to 40, it might come back to 60. And um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of change or reason for it. But the danger here is I'm kind of putting myself above the God given authority that has set this limit. And the fact is, it's not against God's law for me to have to drive a little bit slower. It just means I might not get there as quickly as I'd like to. And that means I've got to obey. And there probably is a good reason for it. It's just that I don't know what it is. But actually, we obey the rules and regulations that our government put in place because they're for the benefit of everyone. And they go above our individual selfish and self-centred opinions and needs. And none of those None of those things are ever a justification for saying, well, I'm going to obey that law, but I'm not going to obey that one. No, we obey them all. And finally, and I think this is really positive as well, we contribute, we get involved. Some of that we do by paying taxes, obviously, or by voting for our government. But also there's more direct things we do. And um, I think it's interesting, isn't it, when we talk about paying taxes, because actually... The government in Paul's time probably spent their money a lot more selfishly and indulgently than the current government does. But he still said to pay them. And um, the reason we do that is because as Jesus tells us, and I'm going to look at a, a passage which tells us a bit more about that in a second, that the church and the state have different roles. And we're really all better off when we recognise that and we leave each other to do what is best. And I'm going to read this story uh, about where Jesus was asked about paying taxes. And it was based on an attempt to trick him, to either get him to come out against the government or to come out against the temple authorities. And his answer, as many of you know, was absolutely brilliant. So we're looking at Matthew, and we're in Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. And it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they marveled and they left him and they went away. Such a brilliant answer. 
And I think this helps us to understand the position of the church and the state. They're not above or below one another, but they're in a partnership. Each has its own area of responsibility and its own part to play. The state should not be over the church telling it what to do in its area. The church shouldn't be over the state interfering in things that are not its job to do with. And the church should never compromise its role to gain the favour of the state or ignoring when the state oversteps its authority and not challenging it. The ideal is the church and state interdependent yet dependent on one another, each existing to support the other in the role it has. And for us, individually and as a church, the way we do that best is by being good citizens, as Paul is telling us to be. John Stott, in his commentary on Romans, puts it, up, puts it so well, sums it up so well. I'm just going to read what he says. And he says, in consequence, Christians who recognise that the state's authority and ministry comes from God will do more than tolerate it as if it were a necessary evil. Conscientious Christians will submit to its authority, honour its representatives, pay its taxes and pray for its welfare. They will also encourage the state to fulfil its state-appointed role and in as far as they have the opportunity, actively participate in its work. So I want us to finish really with three things that I think we need to do to respond to this passage that will help us to be good citizens. And they're all very practical. And the first one is repent. Because the fact is, it's not right or godly to be critical and cynical to those that God has placed in authority over us. Yet, we have a God-given responsibility to question them and to make sure that they are acting justly and they're acting with mercy. But we do not have a responsibility to moan and treat them with disrespect. That is sin. And like all sin, we need to confess it before God and repent. And not do it. And then we do what we can. We do what we can to support and contribute to our government with the opportunities that come our way. You know, we now have a parish councillor in Craig. Um, I know that guys have been school governors at times. This is one way we can play our part getting involved in local government. Um, others serve by working for the government in the civil service in various areas or for the NHS or as teachers. Some of us are involved with social action of different types. We're working for justice for the vulnerable and the weak. And not all of us can do that. But when we can, let's grasp the opportunities that God gives us to support our governing opportunities at every level in every way that we can. But there's one thing we can all do, and that is pray. Governing with all the complex and competing needs in normal times is hard enough, isn't it? But at times like these, it must be so much harder and so much more difficult to, to do the right thing. And therefore, we must bring all our leaders and public servants to God and ask him to give them the wisdom they need to do their difficult and demanding jobs well. And they're not perfect. They do and they will get things wrong. And they won't always serve with the integrity and selfishness that they should. But surely, if we want them to do this, then we need to pray, because that will make it change for the better, surely. But only, of course, if we do pray. So please keep praying for our government, both in your own prayer times and when we gather together to pray. And I was thinking as I finished, when Jesus came to the earth, he didn't do the obvious thing that the Jews thought he would do as the Messiah. He didn't replace the Roman authorities and restore a godly government. Instead, by example, he lived a life serving others. And he just taught a few people, 12 ordinary men, and a few other people who gathered with him. And yet the life that he lived impacted the world. And we might think that by being good citizens and serving our community and praying for our leaders, that's no big deal and won't make much of a difference. But just think about the way that the early church lived and how eventually they impacted the Roman Empire by the way that they served people, by the, the way that they looked after people, to such an extent that the, the Roman Empire ended up turning to Jesus. And maybe we, as God's help, we can, as God's church, have such an impact in Billingsworth and beyond.
just by being the good citizens that Jesus calls us to be. Let's pray. Yeah, Father God, I thank you for the those that you've put in over us and in authority over us. I thank you that, that we enjoy protection and safety. And yes, Lord, they are not perfect. So Lord, I do pray for them. And I do pray that you help us to keep lifting them up in prayer and uh, asking you, God, to give them the wisdom that they need to take us through the difficult times that we are facing at the moment. And Father God, I want to pray, Lord, too, that you'd speak to each one of us about the things that we could do to make art play our part and to bring the change that you can bring through the way that we live and the way that we serve other people and the way that we show the love of Jesus. Because, Lord, ultimately, we want people to come to know you. And through doing this, we help that to happen. So, Father God, just help us and, and just thank you for your for your goodness and all the things that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Neil, for that challenge. Um, it's really hard to support um, the authorities sometimes. It's really difficult. And those in places of authority, um, you know, they tend to know the weight that's on their shoulders. Um, you know, and I know with stepping on with the, being a parish councillor, um, okay, it's very low level government, but it is a responsibility and it is a weight. And um, uh, so, you know, it's really important that we pray for those in authority as also as we listen to them and seek to follow their advice as best we can. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I'm going to just close us off in prayer and uh, I'm going to pray for our country as we are steadily coming out of lockdown. Lord God, I thank you um, for this morning. I thank you for our country, Lord, for the way that um, things are easing up. And I pray, Lord God, that we would make, um, make changes well as a church and as a country, Lord. Let us make changes well that uh, aren't going to feed into the pandemic, um, but are going to um, just be a blessing to everyone, to be able to get back to some sort of normal. Uh, Lord God, I thank you that the hairdressers are open. Um, I'm sure everyone noticed I've had a haircut. But I thank you for the people like that, Lord God, who have had a hard time so far um, through this lockdown, but now they're able to get back to work and stuff like that, Lord God. So I just thank you that there are industries that are coming back. And I pray that you would enable the government to release things at the right time and where needed to lock things back down again swiftly so that um, yeah, we, are, we can be as safe as we can. I pray, Lord, that as we come out of lockdown, as church starts to move forward, and I'm so grateful to you, Lord, that it, things are moving forward, um, I just pray that we would be able to um, uh, make those decisions carefully and wisely and that it would be after hearing your voice that we step out. Thank you, Lord, and pray that you bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, have a great week, everyone. We're now going to go to our home group hangouts, and uh, so I really hope to see my home group, and it'll be great for other, other people in the church to see you as well. So please do get along. Um, if you aren't in a home group, then please do get in touch with us via the church office uh, email address, and um, we'd love to get you into a home group so you can meet some people. Uh, and uh, other than that, have a great week, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.